I want to start by saying what an honor and a privilege it is to be here, um, not only because of the location where we are and my past, but also because I want to acknowledge that there are often people with brown skin who don't get the same opportunities, second chances that I get. My story began 24 years ago. This was me in 1995, uh, just before I left the American white supremacist movement that I helped build from the very beginning. But before that, I came from a normal family. Uh, I was not raised to be racist. My parents are Italian immigrants who uh, immigrated to the United States in the mid 1960s. And I was not raised in a home uh, of racism. Uh, in fact, it was the opposite. My parents were often the victims of prejudice when they arrived in the United States. But I was also bullied for most of my youth growing up. I didn't have very many friends. Uh, I didn't know who I was or where I belonged. Growing up in an Italian family in Chicago from the United States, um, I had a hard time trying to be American, even in my own town. So I had a hard time understanding who I was growing up. So I started to really act out. Uh, when I was younger, I started to be delinquent to try and get the attention of my parents. At 14 years old, um, I was standing in a street uh, and I was smoking a joint and a man came to me and he pulled a joint from my mouth and he looked me in the eyes and he said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to take control of your life. I didn't know at 14 years old what a communist was, if I met a Jewish person, or even what it meant to feel like my life was being controlled, except for through my parents. So at that moment, I didn't understand, but I was being recruited at 14 years old into America's first neo-Nazi skinhead group. I was ambitious as a young kid. I was idealistic. I wanted to change the world for the better, but I didn't know how. And the man who recruited me at 14 years old started to fill me with a sense of purpose. He started to help me understand uh, where I fit in. And for somebody who was very powerless uh, before then, when I was recruited, it changed. Things started to feel different. I felt more powerful. And for eight years, until I was almost 23 years old, uh, every day I spent feeling like I hated other people, feeling like I wanted to destroy people who were not like me, people who looked different, who prayed to a different God, or who loved somebody different. And I started to be violent. I started to recruit other young people uh, based on the same sense of fear that I felt. What I didn't understand at the time was that all of my hatred for other people really stemmed from the self-hatred that I felt for myself. I was too afraid to analyze it, to reflect on what was troubling me on the inside that I was projecting it onto other people. What would make a normal kid from a good family go down a bad path of terrorism or extremism like I did? I come from Chicago. We have a lot of potholes in the roads in Chicago. And I, the way I describe it is, in my life's journey, I hit a lot of potholes that detoured my path. Potholes can be anything like trauma, emotional trauma, physical trauma, mental illness, poverty, joblessness. For me, it was abandonment. I felt abandoned by my parents, who as immigrants had to work seven days a week, 16 hours a day. As a young kid, I didn't understand why they weren't there, so I blamed myself for that. When I hit those potholes, my road got detoured. And when I was detoured on the outside, there were people waiting there for me with uh, an idea, with an ideology to sell it to me. It could have been crime, it could have been drugs, it could have been a gang. For me, it was uh, an American neo-Nazi. And the truth is, is it did fill me with a sense of purpose at first. It did make me feel like I was a part of a family. I had gone from invisible uh, as a young boy to somebody who now was feared, who people were afraid of, who had a sense of power. I became intoxicated by this new feeling of power. 
But the one, the three things that were the most important to me as I had these potholes in my road was I was searching for three important things, identity, community, and purpose. That's something that everybody in this room searches for, it's something that's very important that helps us make every decision in our life. Growing up, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know if I was Italian or American. I didn't know who my family was because I didn't see my parents. And I didn't know what my purpose was. Even though I knew I wanted to do something good, I was very shy. I was very quiet. I didn't know how to express myself. My identity was clear. We all dressed the same. We said the same words. We listened to the same music. We went to the same places, and when people saw us, we were like a military. It was very clear what my identity was now. And my community was also very clear. I felt abandoned by my parents. Uh, even though they, they didn't abandon me, uh, I was just very insecure. And I found a family in this group. It was not a local gang. It was a global family. This picture is in Germany in 1992, and that's me on stage singing songs uh, with my band to spread propaganda to thousands of people in the crowd. And my purpose was also something that was given to me. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but the mission was very clear. It was not just about hating people that were not like me. What it came down to was me destroying the earth to start over again. It was about burning everything down because I was angry. That became my purpose. When I came back from that trip in Germany, things changed. I met a girl and we fell in love. She was not a supporter of the same ideology. So even though I never brought the ideology home, it was still a heavy burden for my wife and my children. At 19 years old, we got married and had our first son. And at 21, we had our second son. My family, my wife and my children were the first things in my life to challenge the sense of identity, community and purpose that I found in the movement because I had to ask myself for the first time, was I a hater or was I a father and a husband? Was my community the group that I had surrounded myself with because I felt insecure or was it my family that I gave life to? And suddenly I had this this confusion in my head about where I belonged. I wish I could tell you I made the right decision. I did not. I chose the movement over my family because I was afraid of starting with a new identity, community, and purpose. The only thing that I knew how to be from the time I was 14 was this extremist. I was afraid to choose my family because I was afraid to start over. Ultimately, my wife left and she took the children and I hit the bottom. I was depressed. I didn't know who I was anymore or where I belonged. Even though my wife and children left me, I still wanted to be a part of the movement because I was afraid to start over. So I decided that I was going to open a record shop to sell racist music that I was importing from Europe and from, that I was making myself and from the United States. But it was a little sabotage for myself because I knew that I couldn't get a, license, a business license to sell racist music. So I sold hip hop and punk rock and heavy metal too. And it was the first time in my life that I had meaningful interactions with the people that I thought I hated. I started to meet people who were black and Jewish and gay for the first time in my life. And I realized after some time that I had much more in common with them, that I appreciated them more as people than I did all the people that I'd surrounded myself with. They chose not to attack me, even though they knew who I was. They chose to show me compassion at a time when I least deserved it. When I became embarrassed to sell the racist music, I removed it from the store. And because it was so much of my revenue, I couldn't keep the store open. I had to close the store. 
I wish I could tell you I was very brave when I left the movement, when I disengaged. I wish I could tell you that I told them to go to hell, but I didn't. I was too afraid to do that, so instead I ran as fast as I could away from it. I tried to outrun who I used to be, but even though I was treating other people with respect, I was still dying inside. I was still miserable, and I couldn't understand why. So for five years after I left, um, I didn't talk about my past. Um, I didn't admit who I used to be uh, until I met uh, a friend who encouraged me to go look for a job uh, at a company called IBM. I told her she was crazy. I had gone to six high schools. I got kicked out of all of them, one of them twice. I didn't own a computer. I was an ex-Nazi. Uh, and I had no skills in that field. When I went in for my interview, um, they asked me to come back for a second interview, and then they offered me a job. And the job was a starting position, just setting up computers at businesses and the local schools. It was like an entry-level position. And I was so excited because my life was going to change. Something good was going to happen to me for the first time. And I was so happy until they told me where I was going to go for my first day of work. My first day at work would be installing the computers at my old high school, the same one I got kicked out of twice. Suddenly I wasn't so happy anymore. I was scared. And the first person I saw when I went to the school was the black security guard that I'd gotten in a fist fight with that got me kicked out the second time. I didn't know what to say to him. Uh, I was afraid, uh, and I said, I'm sorry. And he looked at me and he said, that makes you feel good, but it doesn't do anything for me. He encouraged me to tell my story because he understood that it was not just the story of a young white boy who became a neo-Nazi, but the story of every young person who is looking for identity, community, and purpose. And he made me promise that I would learn to forgive myself and to seek forgiveness for others by repairing the damage that I had caused. 23 years later, I'm still telling my story. I've also reconnected with my family. Uh, my boys are now 27 and 25 years old, older than all of you, I think. Uh, and uh, I'm remarried. I've uh, been with my wife for 18 years. For the last 20 years, uh, I have been helping people disengage from extremist groups, and one of the way that I do that, one of the ways that I do that is through my organization, the Free Radicals Project. I don't help people by telling them that they're wrong. I don't debate them. I don't argue with them. Instead, I listen, and I listen for potholes. And some of the ways that I actually help people change their minds is not by changing their ideas, but by helping them build resilience in themselves through job training, education, uh, tattoo removal, mental health therapy, and things like that. So I've given up a job with computers to become a pothole filler and a bridge builder in many ways. The way that I challenge their ideology when I work with people is by introducing them to the people that they think that they hate. I want to tell you the story of one person uh, that I've worked with uh, in the last few years. His name is Daryl. Daryl was 31 years old um, when he contacted me. He had been in the U.S. military and was injured during the training before he went to war. He was very angry when he saw his friends, his brothers, going off to fight, uh, and he couldn't go, and he was sent back home. And when he came back, he started to get very angry. He started to become very racist against Muslims. One day, after speaking to him on the phone for uh, a few weeks, he told me that he was in the park, and he saw a Muslim man praying on the ground. And he stopped himself, but he wanted to go up to that man and kick him in the face. I flew from Chicago to Buffalo, New York uh, the next day because I told him we had to sit down and talk. And one of the first questions that I asked Daryl when I met him was, have you ever met a Muslim before? And he said, no, I don't want to. They're evil. They hate me and I hate them. I don't want anything to do with them. I excused myself for the toilet, and in the bathroom I got my phone, and I called the local mosque. I spoke with the imam at the mosque, uh, and I said, 
Imam, I have a Christian man here who would really love to learn more about your religion. Do you mind if we stop by? When I told Daryl where we were going, uh, he got very upset. He started to argue with me and he started to get very nervous. And finally, after a long discussion, I convinced him to go. But when we arrived at the mosque, we were late. We only had five minutes. The imam was only free for a few more minutes. After two hours, we stayed in, this, uh, in the mosque, in a conference room, uh, even though the imam said he only had five minutes for us. We talked about life. We talked about our families. We talked about religion. And very strangely, we talked about Chuck Norris. They both loved Chuck Norris for some reason. I'm happy to say that there's not a week that goes by where the two best friends don't go out to lunch to eat falafel together now because they've spent this time getting to know each other and Daryl has lost the fear. His hatred was born of fear. He's still a Christian, but he loves to volunteer at the mosque to help set up chairs. Uh, if they have events, he likes to go cook with them and he considers them family now. Hatred is born of ignorance. Fear is its father and isolation is its mother. In the last 20 years, I've used that same process to help over 300 people disengage from extremism. I don't argue with them. I don't tell them that they're wrong, even though I know that they are. And the effect of going through this process of building themselves up, of losing the fear, and then meeting the people that they think that they hate has been the most powerful tool.